let us go to the best-selling book of all times, the Word of God itself. The Spirit of the Word gives life. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Amen. 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 Love you too. Revelation 3, verse 1 through 6. Y'all sound like you're ready this morning. Here we get to read a personal letter penned or actually articulated through the pen of John, but they are the words of Christ in resurrection to the church in Sardis. Let us read together. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Yeah. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard and hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few, yet you have a few people, yet you have a few people, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Go back to verse 1 again for just a moment. Go back. To the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Go on. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Not what you lost. <laughs> Not what you hope to gain. Strengthen what remains. Look at your neighbor and say, strengthen what remains. Give me, go to John for just a moment. After this, you can sit the rest of the day. You can sit all day. Amen. We'll get a chair and roll you out. John 6, 60 through 69. Here we hear the words of Jesus. I will cross-pollinate these two texts together that we might extrapolate from it a truth that the Holy Spirit has planted in my heart for you. I have the sense in my spirit that I am speaking directly and specifically to somebody's life today and a bit prophetically as it were. And God has used these two scriptures to cohabitate together to give an answer to something you have been praying about. And if you will bear with me as I attempt to coordinate and knit the text together that we might have the profundity of thought to understand what God is saying at this moment in all of the noise that we're hearing in the world today. It's coming at us through our phones, it's coming at us through our iPads, through our televisions. So we're bombarded with opinions today, yet the only opinion that matters is what God is saying. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When we go to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verse 60, we are stepping almost into a war zone of theological debate. It is the moment in Jesus' ministry where he tips over the edge theologically and says something so powerful and yet so 
debatable that even many that were with him turned and walked away. Have you ever been left? <laughs> On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom? <laughs> to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Strengthen what remains. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh over your word today. Manifest yourself in the midst of your people. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Yes, sir, let's go for it. I'm going to do it too. Every time you turn on the TV set right now, there are advertisements and commercials uh, provo provoking mothers and fathers to rush out to the store to get their children ready for school. I noticed this morning in the pre-show there was a series of prayers prayed over people who are going back to school. Amen. Whether you are in the classroom as a student or as a teacher, we are praying for you because these are difficult times. It, it was always difficult to be an educator, but it's especially difficult right now. I was raised by an educator. I understand what it's like to be in the classroom. And it was always challenging managing all those different personalities and the principals and the school board and the politics of dealing with what you've got to do. And it is not really a job, it's calling. It's calling. You have to be called to it to do it. Overtaxed and underpaid, challenged by systems that you have to contend with and you're almost parenting while you're teaching. It's a tough job. Going to school now is a tough job. You've got enemies to fight, seen and unseen, not just peer pressure and the conversations we used to have a long time ago. Now it's mask or no mask, mask on, mask off. We don't know what viral infection or what student is going to come in with a gun. We are living in changing times. Everybody who is going back in a classroom, stand up on your feet. Everybody's going back in the classroom, whether you're a teacher or a student, going back in the classroom, stand up on your feet. These are sheroes and heroes. Come on, make some noise. Father, cover them with the blood and overshadow them in the name of Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus that they would be protected from danger within and without on every side, that they would be anointed, that they would be covered, that they would be innovative and creative and effective like they've never been before, that they would feel the reward inwardly for the work that they have done, that they would have the fulfillment that is necessary to be effective at what they do, that you would anoint them with concepts to penetrate even the hardest shell student, that change and transformation would happen for that one who's going back and wondering, can I 
still learn. I thank you in the name of Jesus that their thoughts will be clear and their mind will be open and like a sponge they will funnel in truth that will change the trajectory of their life and I believe it and call it done in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Come on make some noise. Years ago when I got ready to go to school, it wasn't like the times we're living in now. Uh, I wasn't in the place I am now. My parents wasn't in the place that they ended up in the latter years of their life. I can remember so well, and my sister sitting on the front row can relate to this, I'm sure my mother took me shopping to buy fabric to make my clothes for school. It wasn't about the latest toys, the latest gadgets, the latest things. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. At that time, she didn't drive. We didn't have much money. Uh, I didn't feel the pressure to be fashionable like, like the children are faced with today. I didn't have to be in with the latest thing. I didn't have to be dressed a certain way. I just wanted to have some clothes. Still going shopping for something other than groceries and carrying bags to the bus stop because my mother couldn't drive, and crossing the railroad tracks where the bus dropped us off, only to climb up the path up the hill to get to the house while carrying bags of groceries, trying not to break the eggs, to get a chance to go downtown meant you had to take another bus and we were headed downtown on another bus and I was glad to be going anywhere other than to the grocery store which was challenging. It is difficult for me to comprehend today what people call tough. <laughs> I had to go up the hill and across the path and across the railroad tracks and catch the bus with my mother carrying bags to get them home. And you are upset because you can't get a parking space close enough to the door. It, I won't bother you about that, it's, it's just, just me. We were headed downtown to, to go shopping, Charleston, where all the stores were, the real stores, uh, uh, where the Diamond Department stores was, and Stone and Thomas was, and all those great places of shopping, you know what I'm talking about, come on with me. And maybe, maybe, maybe if I was lucky, we would get some candy and some nuts at Mr. Peanut's shop. That would be great. We walked past all the beautifully clad windows where rich people shopped, all the mannequins brightly arrayed uh, in the finest decor, amazing displays, uh, opulently displayed to entice people into shop and get their wares. But my mother didn't go there. I didn't even notice that we window shopped but never went in. I realize in retrospect that we were poor, but that word was never mentioned in my house. I remember vividly the smells of the bakery shops, the hot air from the dry cleaners, the smell of pizza, the smell of the bakery stops we walked past, and the tight grip of her hand moving me ever so gently further down the street till we got to Singer's, the fabric shop where we would go upstairs to find the remnants. You see, my mother, even in the fabric shop, did not buy fabric that was not on sale. And to all of you who do, know, who do not know what remnants are as it relates to fabric, it is the last part of bolts of fabric that was too little to sell in the main department. They were remnants. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. They, <clears throat> they were remnants. And the reason I went is so that she could see if the remnant was enough. So I was kind of like her mannequin to stretch it out and decide if we could use the remnants. You see, she had caught the bus and and walked the path past the stores only to get fabric that was on the remnant table. Where she planned to dress me and my siblings. 
she dressed us in remnants. They weren't rags now. <laughs> they were remnants. Remnants is what's left on the boat. <laughs> the young people are looking at me like I'm crazy. It's, it's not Gucci, baby. It's remnants. <laughs> It's not Louis Vuitton, baby, it's remnants. Uh, it's not even Nike, it's remnants, it's remnants. It's something that she took, something that almost was forgotten and made something out of it. She valued it. She would make shirts for me and blouses for Jacqueline, a few trousers for Ernest, all from discounted remnants. So today, we go to the remnant table. Today we go to the remnant table to stitch two texts together that are as different as wool from satin or burlap from linen. Two texts that seem like they don't have anything to do with each other and yet it is my responsibility to measure them and stretch them and sew them and stitch them together. What in the world does the St. John text where Jesus is talking about unless you eat my blood and drink my flesh, uh, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you'll have no part with me. What in the world does that have to do with the apocalyptic text of Revelations writing to the church at Sardis where he says, I strengthen the things that remain. They are both remnant messages on the table of the carpenter's son. Let's not discount what can be done with the fabric of a the theological table of texts bypassed by scholars and ignored by contemporary tailors of texts who like the creativity to see what can be done from God's, God's remnant table. Though it may seem strange to you this morning that I'm talking to you about remnants, it should not be strange. It's unfortunate that only certain texts are preached about in this contemporary society because the truth of the matter is the word remnant is mentioned 540 times in the Bible. And yet you hardly ever hear anybody talking about remnants. This would be a difficult message to preach. It's gonna be a hard message to preach because I'm preaching against the trends of the culture we're living in. Who is racing on the Autobahn of technology to be fast, to be first, to be feverishly, frantically in pursuit of what's next. If you are pursuing, if all that you are pursuing is what is next, you will always find that what's next at the expense of losing what's left. Today I'm going to swim against the current and go against the grain and probably get on someone's nerves whose only focus is to be innovative, titillating, explore trends, what's new, what's fresh. If you're from the streets, I'm fresh. You don't know anything about remnants. I'm not here to talk to you about the next new and improved anything. I simply want to know if you will grab my hand like I grab my mother's hand and take a serious look at why God mentions this word 540 times and mostly in reference to prophetic fulfillment. Why is God in love with remnants? Let's start with the text in Revelations. Are you with me? I love y'all. <laughs> there is no other place I'd rather preach in the world than the potter's house. I tell you, this is, this is my church. This is my world. The book of Revelations is penned by John, but authored by Jesus. You must understand the book is divided into three categories and it divides itself when it explains itself by saying, John, write the things which thou hast seen 
and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So when John writes about seeing Jesus with his hair like lamb's wool and his feet as if they had been burned, he is writing about what he has seen. When he writes to the churches, he is writing about the things which are. And when God says, come up hither, I will show you the things which shall be hereafter. This is the syllabus from which revelation is written. It is the masterpiece because it is Jesus responding to the question that the disciples ask him, when should be the sign of your coming and what shall be the end of the age? He said, it is not given to the son to know, but the father which is in heaven because he had not yet been to the cross. But the book of Revelations is him writing back over the balconies of heaven down to John to answer the question. Though John himself is a remnant. John is a remnant because all the other apostles are now gone. And John is all that's left. And Jesus is talking to a remnant about a remnant. Wonder how many of you are the only one left still standing with stubborn, bodacious faith and tenacity, unrelenting, unwavering, standing by yourself, standing in the integrity of who you are in Christ, even when other friends have gone in other directions. And yes, you have suffered some losses along the way, but you are still here. You see the text in Revelation 3 is largely a clarion call to strengthen the remnant because all that stood around the remnant had, had really fallen away. They had a reputation that they were alive, but they really were not. They had been so influenced by the culture and the world around them that they had lost their identity in exchange for popularity. If you're not careful, you can lose your identity seeking popularity and lose sight of who you are trying to fit in with who they want you to be. <laughs> and the church had lost its way trying to pursue the culture. You had to be relevant to the culture. And they were so re relevant to the culture that they had lost sight of who they were. And the book of Revelation says that only a remnant was recognizable. I want to be in the number of people who resist the trends and winds of fluctuation and know who I am so that I don't get caught up in the current of who you want me to be and lose sight of who God created me to be. Even if I end up on the table, I would rather be a few in number and know who I am than to be diluted and polluted by public opinion until I lose all sight and direction and uniqueness of my own self. That means I'll do it if I have to do it by my. That means you don't have to like me, but you do have to respect me. <laughs> you don't have to agree with me, but I refuse to let you discard me because I'm willing to be a remnant. Even if it's at the expense of not being relevant to you because God works with remnants. He says, strengthen the things that remain before the influence of the world has taken root. There are still a few people in Sardis that are yet holding on. The tolerance of sin had taken its toll, a deadly, Spiritual cancer known as complacency had unknowingly made its way into the church and sucked the spiritual life out of it without even a fight. But not the few, they were still holding on. While he rebuked the church in Sardis, he did not rebuke the remnant. Instead, he revived it. And the Lord said, I am going to revive the people who are 
Holy Lord. <clears throat> so you might be tired and you might be winded and you might be frustrated and you might be alienated and you've been asking God how long God said, I am going to revive the remnant who are still holding on in spite of the storms and the winds. And he said, I want you to focus not on who left, not on who you lost, not on who walked away. I want you to focus on strengthening that which remains. Oh, this is good to my soul. The letter is harsh and straightforward. It is designed and written to the pastor where to focus his energy. Not to focus your energy on trying to get back people who walked away. Let them go. Let me say it louder for the people in the back. Let them go. This is a time in your life that you can no longer continue to grieve about who walked away, who abandoned you, who forsook you, who left you, who walked away. You've got to stand up and recognize that God doesn't need anything that you lost to bless you. God will always use what you've got left. I'm talking to somebody I don't even know who it is, but the Bible said, wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Strengthen what remains. Oh, oh my God. This, this, is, this is challenging because the vast majority of the church had become a victim of the societal culture. Yet there was a minority that was fighting to refrain from the gravitational pull ever downward. Because there's always something to pull you down instead of up and forward. The remnant wasn't perfect. They were almost dead but yet holding on. The power of the sentence, in fact, is almost dead, but not quite. God said, before death can get you, I'm going to strengthen what remains. Can I talk to tired folks and weary folks and run down people who are at the end of their rope, who have to fight their way through all kinds of storms and all kinds of tragedies and all kinds of adversity just to be who you are and get where you're going. I've got news for you. God is about to strengthen you like you've never been strengthened before. And then let me challenge the thinking people because the great challenge in our lives is how can we be innovative and creative and productive and go forward without losing what we had. Sometimes you become so addicted to what's next that you don't focus on what's now. And if you walk away from what's now, trying to establish what's next, then next will only replace now and you haven't really progressed at all. And the reason you're so tired is because you're so busy getting to next and losing now that you're still at home plate. After all of these years, you haven't gained anything because you're just swapping out next with now, now with next, next with now, next with now. All of a sudden, you've got to strengthen what remains before you can gain what's next. So we're stuck in between in this text, two different dilemmas. One is not to try to get back what I lost. And the other one is not to fall in love with where I'm going at the expense 
of expunging where I'm at. Let me work with this. I'm going to bring it on down home. It is like growing up in a home where the troubled child gets all the attention. And the good child gets none. Because there's so much drama coming from this kid that all the parents focus is, is trying to get back what they lost and they don't strengthen what they have. And if you're not careful, the one who was the good child will start acting up for the attention because you're teaching them that the only way to get your attention is to be bad enough. This is a hidden lesson in the prodigal son. It's not just about the boy going and coming back. It is about the neglect of the elder brother because the father is so focused on what he lost that he neglected what he had. Because it's hard to strengthen what remains because what remains becomes common. and normal and ordinary and so predictable and so dependable that you take it for granted until it dies. If you are not careful, you will undervalue who stayed. <laughs> Trying to get back who left or get who's next. Because sometimes there's nothing really sexy about being a remnant, about being dependable, about being stable, about hanging in there, about being by your side. If you're not careful, you will neglect the people that stayed with you. For the people who are next to you. But we serve a God who is talking to us in 540 texts that what he is interested in is the remnants. He always preserves the remnants. His promise is to the remnants. His prophecy is to the remnants. Over and over and over again, the Bible tells us the value of people who stick it out and hang in there and take a licking and keep on ticking and that God has promises that you can only get, come on Bible class, if you abide, if you abide, 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 if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will. I'm not going to give you nothing if you leave, but if you abide, I will open up the windows of heaven and pull you out a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. If you see me when I'm taken up, you will have a double portion of my spirit, but I can't give this to people who are doing one night stands. Because the anointing falls on people who stay. Let me see. Both texts were written by the apostle John. Both texts have a senator, sinister overtone. Both texts have John reporting the words of Jesus. Both texts are at inflection points. Both texts speak of separation. Both texts have a sense of cynicism. Both texts are connected to a principle that I am sharing with you. The principle is profound and provocative that you need to focus on what you got left. The child that stayed, the friend who stuck, the business you got cannot suffer for the business you're going after. Because if you make that mistake again, 
you are only replacing what you lost, which means you are not gaining anything at all. The real test of relationship isn't when it's easy, it's when it's hard. The second text is interesting. Can I pick it up for a minute and play with this piece of garment? The second text is interesting because it is undeniable that Jesus has changed his message from the kingdom of heaven is this and the kingdom of heaven is that and the kingdom of heaven is lacking unto this and that the scriptures might be fulfilled in your hearing and all of those things were palatable and enjoyable and receivable and even though the Pharisees and Sadducees resented him they could not debate against him because he was the word made flesh and it was all cool until he broke out and started talking about death and they got quiet and then he brings up this almost cannibalistic statement. If you're going to be my disciple, imagine now, if I say, if you're going to be a member of the potter's house, you must drink my blood and eat my flesh. You can understand why that would be disruptive. And you say, what? Jesus started talking cannibalistic, drink my blood and eat my flesh to the carnal mind. It was cannibalism. Jesus is actually calling for them to consume him spiritually, not literally. But when you hear with carnal ears, you draw carnal conclusions. And so this was an inflection point to prove, are you a fan or a follower? And all the fans walked away. And what I got out of the text that was really amazing is that Jesus didn't chase them. Stop chasing people who are leaving. Stop chasing people who are offended. Stop chasing people who don't get it. Stop chasing trying to get back in your life. People that God is trying to take out of your life. Jesus simply let them go. He didn't go behind them and say, no, you didn't understand what I'm saying. You don't get what I mean. You don't know where I'm coming from. No, no, let me explain. No, don't go, don't go, don't, don't go. He turned to his disciples, the remnant, and said, will you leave me also? because what I'm going to invest in is what I've got left, not what I lost. You see, Jesus is bringing them to a place of inflection. And the Lord told me, whoever I'm preaching to today, you're at an inflection point. You can neither become so engrossed in your future that you do not feed your present nor so grieved by your past that you're reaching after what has walked away. The word of God to you is to strengthen what remains. Who am I talking to today? This is not about a monologue about death or drinking blood or eating his flesh. It's much more than that. We've got to turn the page on that. We've got to go to the next level on that. We've got to understand that what God is trying to do is bigger than that. He is trying to do a methodology that creates conflict resolution, which is the test between opportunistic people and covenant people. If, if, if you can't take a lick, <laughs> we didn't have covenant in the first place. If, if you can walk away easily, you weren't meant to stay. <laughs> Come on.
I remember I was sitting on the side of the bed as a pastor and I was crying over somebody who had left my church and I was crying because I thought they were going to be there and I was crying because I thought they were loyal and I was crying and because, because they had promised my wife and I that, that they, they would take a bullet for us. You remember that? I would take a bullet for you and two Sundays left they were gone and I literally sat on the side of the bed in West Virginia and cried. And the Lord spoke to me and said, let this be your last day. Let this be your last day of crying over who walked away. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Because all that left you could not stay. And all that stayed could not leave. Woo, I feel something about to break loose in this place. I feel something about to break loose in this place. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I'm breaking the spirit of grief over your life. You cannot live in your history and you can't live in your destiny. You must live in your reality. I am here now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I got to have it now. If I don't strengthen what I got now, I can't get to what I got next. The problem with these people is they were only loyal when they agreed. If you're only loyal when you agree, that's not loyalty at all. Separate in your life fans from followers. Who's with you for the fish and loaves? And who's with you for the long haul? And make sure you don't neglect that remnant who stuck it out with you trying to get into your next circle of influence. I'm almost done, I'm almost done. I'm almost done, I'm almost done. I'm almost done, I'm almost done. But if you're going to be like Jesus, you will let them go. And then ask the remnant, you going to? And then only invest in people who say, where shall I go? In your hands are the words of eternal life. The people who are not optioning out of your life, the people who have made a commitment to walk with you the rest of your life, those are the people that must be strengthened, not neglected. not taken for granted because if you don't strengthen that which remains you won't get to that which is next most people ignore what they have chasing after what they lost or what they want Jesus strengthens the 12 disciples because they are the remnant from what he lost what are you going to do with the years you have left. Type that on the line. What am I going to do with the years I have left? Are you going to spend the years you have left murmuring and complaining about what happened 10 years ago and five years ago and 12 years ago? I don't care if you got five years left. What are you going to do with the years you have left? I don't care if you have one year left. What are you going to do with the year you have left? I don't care if you have the kids in your house just one final year. What are you going to do with that year with those kids before you send them away? Are you going to forever go back in history and rehearse the same things over and over again and miss the fact that every day God gives you is a gift from him to enjoy, to live, to fellowship and have peace? How long will you 
let the enemy steal your day, steal your day, steal your day, steal your moment, steal your hours, steal your second, steal your thought, steal your pulse, steal your wind as you use your breath to rehearse what was. Most miracles were performed with remnants. Have you forgotten the loaves? Have you forgotten Zerubbabel's temple? Have you forgotten that Nehemiah built a new wall out of the stones that remained? What are you going to build with what remains in your life and stop being attracted to what flaunts itself in your life and say <laughs> what flashes in your life rather than what remains in your life? I'm talking to somebody, I don't even get it. Have you forgotten the 144,000 that are saved in the tribulation? Have you forgotten the handful of meal? What I'm trying to get you to see is that whenever God stepped into a house, he always worked with what remains. The prophet said, what do you have in your house? I'm not going to use a miracle outside of your house. I'm going to use something that's left in your house. Something you've been walking past and looking over and getting ready to die. There's a miracle in your house. Touch your neighbor and tell them there's a miracle in your house. 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 You've been walking past it every day, but the Holy Ghost told me to tell you there's a miracle in your house. You don't think it's valuable because it's not quantifiable. You think it's just a handful of meal, but God said the miracle is gonna come through the meal. The thing you've been walking past feeling insufficient about is the very thing God's going to use to take you to the next level. Somebody give him 30 seconds of praise. Other widow who is a remnant by virtue of being a widow anyway is about to sell her sons to the creditors because she has overlooked a pot of oil in her house. And God said, I'm going to take what you got left and I'm going to pour out of what you got left even though you think it is inadequate. I'm going to stretch what you call inadequate until it is more than enough. Increase is coming out of the seed that remains in your life, in your spirit, in your heart, in your gifting, something that the devil keeps telling you it has no life in it. God said, I'm going to tip it up and let it flow and flow and flow and flow. You've been walking past it, but it's right in your house. Have you forgotten that the Apostle Paul was saved not by the ship, but by the pieces of the ship? That all he had was a remnant from the boat, but he grabbed a hope to the remnant and made it to the, through the storm and made it safely to the other side because he valued what he had left. Have you forgotten that many will depart from the faith, but the remnant will be saved? Jesus is coming back for what's left. Jesus always comes to what's left. Jesus is coming for what's left. And I came to tell you, in spite of what the devil told you, you still got some left. You've been through hell, but you got some left. You've been in a storm, but you still got something left. You've had some tough throws and heels to climb, but you still got something left. Uh, somebody shout, I got something left. I got something left. I might have an issue, but I got something left. I might have been sick for 12 long years, but I got something left. I may have to crawl to get out of this, but I got something left. I might have been bowed over for 18 years, but I still got something left. Abraham, I might be 100 years old, 
but I still got something left. Sarah, I might have been barren all my life, but I still got something left. Lazarus, you might have been in the tomb and started to stink, but your life is not over. The devil is a lie. I'm getting ready to roll the stone away and snatch you out of your situation. There's a Lazarus listening at me right now. Everything is corroding around you, but the Lord sent me to tell you that you've got something left. Leap out of your grave. Jump out of your grave. Crawl out of your grave. Walk out of your grave. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. I'm coming out of my dry place. I'm coming out of my barren place. I'm coming out of my lonely place. I'm coming out of my depressed place. I'm coming out of my angry place. I'm coming out because I got something. Today, God wants to strengthen what you got left. Today God wants to use what you got left. Today God wants to revive what you got left. Today God wants to prophesy over what you got left. You think it's nothing but there's a miracle in what you got left. Uh, you think it's inadequate but God's gonna do amazing things with what you got left. I know you're tired. I know you're weak. I know you're frustrated. I know you're ready to just fall out but God said you're coming into revival. Your gift is coming into revival. Y your effectiveness is coming into revival. Your relevance is coming into revival and God God said, what you got left is enough. Stand to your feet as I prepare to close today. Don't you dare lose what you have left. But this is a moment to strengthen What remains the friends you don't call because you kind of take them for granted strengthen that because the miracle is in the remnants the little bit of fabric left on the bolt is more than enough to cover you in the times you're living in right now. Go ahead, think innovative, be progressive, but don't damage what you have trying to get what you want. You remember years ago when I was teaching the 80-20 rule? And I would say that most married people marry somebody who's 80% of what they want, but 20% looks huge when you're not getting it. And so they leave the 80 to get the 20, only to move in with the 20 and miss the 80. Because the only thing that makes the 20 look valuable is because it supplements the 80. But if you lose your 80 going after your 20, This is a moment in time that the enemy is trying to wear out the faithful. To simply exhaust you with threats and trouble and burdens and distractions. And God said that this morning he wants to strengthen the weary the tired, the exhausted. And he told me to tell you that he has not
forgotten your faithfulness. And you can be tired and still be faithful. <laughs> you can be exhausted and still be holding on by a thread. The text says, strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. That if they don't get some strength, they're going to collapse. And I want you to take a minute and strengthen the people who are holding on by a thread. It's you that has the promise. That's why he's trying to wear you out. It's you that has the prophecy. It's you that has the inheritance. It's you that God is going to use in a mighty way. And that's why all hell is breaking loose on every hand to distract you from your focus. If I'm preaching to you, holler at your boy. Be strengthened this morning with all might and with all power and with all diligence. Lift your hands up. Be strengthened in this place right now. Be strengthened. Be strengthened right now in your thoughts, in your mind, in your rest, in your body, in your thoughts, in your fervency and in your fire. This is not the time to faint. This is not the time to give up. This is not the time to collapse. You are closer than you've ever been in your life. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Strengthen the things that remain. For you are on the precipice of your prophecy and your destiny is in view. And if it were not close, you would not be attacked. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the revived of the Lord say so. Let the relentless remnant say so. Let the determined say so. Let the victorious say so. Let the person who's going to fight your way up and out say so. Let the Lazarus that's coming out of the grave say so. I can't hear you.